seated folks. Thank you team. And the song says, you know, the, through the darkness sometimes hide they, you know, we look out in the world and it's <laughs> so chaotic, so evil. It's like, gosh, Lord, are you really there? Sinful man cannot see. And boy, that's been happening for a long, long time. Today is Palm Sunday. It's the triumphal entry. So I'm going to break away from Peter for the next two weeks and focus on this Easter season. And the triumphal entry, it's a prime example. No, go back. I'm not there yet. Thank you. So the triumphal entry is a prime example, prime example of sinful men not being able to see. But we need to look why. Looking at this last week of Christ's life. There's so much that happens. I mean, I could preach a, a complete sermon series just on this last week. There's so many things happening, so many aspects to look at. But we're going to look at just one today. 
And as Team Jesus, we really need to understand this because what is going to, what is, affects the people then is still affecting people today. We need to understand why they didn't have eyes to see who Jesus was. Because it's the same problem today. And we need to help people. And that's what we are called to do as Team Jesus. We are to be preparing to make a difference in people's lives. And the only difference we can make in their lives, are they going to hear the truth of God? Because that's all that matters. And we have been tasked with bringing that truth. So, in understanding that, of being salt and light in this world, we are going to look today at Palm Sunday and how what happened so many years ago is still so relevant for today. It is the day, Palm Sunday, is that we celebrate the triumphal, called the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, one week before his resurrection. Now, as Jesus entered the holy city, he, he neared a, the end of a three-year journey. His ministry is coming to an end. His life is coming to an end. Within just a few days, the city will turn on him and the people will scream for his blood. It's going to be beat, scourged, mocked, scorned. Made to carry a cross up the hill of Golgotha. Be nailed to that cross. Experiencing the most excruciating way of death. He knew all that as he approached the city. And he still approached. And he entered in. The greatest rescue mission in human history. Palm Sunday today was the beginning of the end of Jesus' work on earth. So let's look at that day. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey and tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. Now, a donkey. I mean, this is Jesus. This is the Messiah. Literally, by blood, he is the King of Israel. And by who he is, he's the king of kings. He should be riding a stallion, right? Majestic. He's the only one on earth who's never sinned. He's awesome. He's amazing. But he chooses a donkey. This was prophesied in the book of Zechariah. Donkey. Why would he ride into Jerusalem on a donkey? Peace. You see, if a king was approaching another city, he was going to make war with that city or with that fellow other king. Yes, he approached on a horse. Because that's what God designed horses. Horses are designed for battle. Book of Job tells us that. But when a king was on a mission of peace where he had no hostile intent, he rode a donkey, a humble beast. Jesus is on a peace mission, but that's not what the people want. But Jesus was coming to bring peace between God the Father and sinful humanity. Verse 3 of that chapter, and he says, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of him, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, humbly, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Verse 6, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude 
spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches, the palm branches from trees, and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Why son of David? The heir to the throne of Jerusalem, of Israel. King, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. city erupts into praise and welcoming of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That's basically what they're saying. King. That's what they were looking for. The Jewish people were calling Jesus their king. And in that moment, it must have been a wonderful, wonderful moment. But just within four days, everything changes. We see this in Mark 15. But Pilate answered them saying, Do you want to me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he would, should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they, the people, cried out, Crucify him. There's another account of this in Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Do you understand what he just did? He just declared Jesus just, innocent. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Boy, I don't know if they really thought that statement through. What happened in those four days changed the heart of the people. Let's take a look at what Luke wrote about the triumphal entry. Luke 19, verse 37. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Verse 41, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. This day was about the people. to bring them peace. Verse 43, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side and level you and your children within, with you, within you to the ground. He prophesies what's going to happen to Jerusalem in 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. God was coming to them. God in human flesh was coming to them to bring them peace, to save them from themselves, to save them from sin, 
from the wrath of God, from the judgment and justice of God Almighty. You see, God visits us. He's visiting us, calling, sharing the truth and calling us to him so that we may be saved. You see, here as he approaches the city, Jesus knew everything that was going to happen, include all the bad things that were going to happen to him, but also he knew ahead that these same people that were cheering him and waving the palm branches would soon be screaming for his death. And Jesus wept. He foretold of the destruction and the destruction was severe when the Romans did it. Estimate they killed a million Jews that day. And those Jews in 70 AD who were struck down, more than likely, most of them, were struck down in their sins because they had rejected the only way for their sins to be removed, belief and faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus wept. They missed their moment when God was visiting them to call them to salvation. They did not know the time of their visitation. Why? Why do people miss when God is calling to them and bringing them salvation, having the truth brought to them? Why do they miss this moment? Simply miss the moment Because they're blinded by religion. They see themselves as pretty good people. Not perfect, but better than most. Their religious works, their years sitting in religious services, their dedication to religious causes, they don't really realize that that has not removed their sin. Their belief, I, well, I've always believed, I was raised as a believer and I've always believed in Jesus. I've always loved Jesus ever since I was little. But they were never born again. They're saved because they're good people. They've loved Jesus. They've served Jesus. But we're not saved by anything we do. We're saved by what he has done. A lot of people miss this visitation of God to them because of religion. Others are too caught up in the cares of this life. That's easy to do. Maybe our jobs, our employment, our careers, our education, our plans, families, all sorts of things. I didn't have any time for God most of my Life, because I had too many plans and things I wanted to do. We missed the moment of visitation. Some are caught up in what they want from God. See, they have their own plan, what they want from God. Just like the Jews here in the city had their own plans for Jesus, and he didn't meet them, so they turned on him. Because he didn't do what they wanted him to do. A lot of times we miss the truth of God because we don't like what God is presenting to us because that's not what we want. Many are just caught up in sin because sin can feel good, sin can be fun for a while. You're feeling good the whole time. It's slowly destroying you. And then one day you're destroyed. One day you're judged. It's very sad. How many ways and how many things keep us from seeing 
when God visits us. But luckily for most of us, God visits more than once. Praise God for that, right? But here, these people missed. This is why Jesus weeps. Now, here's what he does. What do you think is one of the first things he's, he's in, ridden into town, being declared as king? He's a rock star. What do you think is the first thing he's going to do when he gets into town? Luke 19, verse 45. Then he went to the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer. But you made it a den of thieves. Do you realize that Jesus didn't cleanse the t- temple once? He did it twice. He did it in the beginning of his ministry, and now he's doing it at the very end again. He goes to the temple, cleanses the temple for the second time. Why is this important for us to know this? You see, the temple had become the faith of the people. That temple represented to them God with them. And the whole time, the temple was pointing to Jesus Christ. But they took it as they were special because of the temple. They're God's children. And by faith, because they had the temple. It had become a point of pride and self-righteousness. Where the temple had no longer become them humbly coming into the Lord's presence and worshiping God. No, they were worshiping themselves. The leaders and the people. Even the disciples were in awe of the building when they were on the Mount of Olives and, and you could see the temple across the little valley there and the, and the disciples said, look, Jesus, look at, the, look at that temple. Isn't it awesome? Jesus looks over and goes, yeah, well, soon there's not going to be one stone upon the other. It's going to be destroyed. You see, the temple had made the people proud. The beauty, the wealth of the temple it represented their religious ways. It represented their great Jewish history because that's where they, they just, because we're Jews, we're good. We're God's people. The rest of you guys are dogs out there in the Gentile world. We're Jews, so we're good. The temple represented that they were God's children. It was like the temple had become their salvation. But if you remember, that veil inside the temple was ripped. And an earthquake rocked that temple. And all that temple was was to point them to Jesus Christ. But their hearts were focused on the building. On their religious traditions they did in the building that made them special and right with God. Instead of looking at their hearts, seeing the sinfulness, the pride and the self-righteousness that so many still have today. Instead of looking at themselves They look to this temple. Remember what Jesus said earlier in his ministry, Matthew 15, verse 7. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. We call it church tradition today. They 
speak of me, they say they love me, but their heart says otherwise. They worship me, but in vanity. We worship God this morning for who he is, for what he has done for us. We worship our thankfulness because he died for us. They worshiped in vain because they were all about what man says, not about what this said. And they had... They had all that. They had all that. And all this pointed to Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus is all through the Old Testament. But they didn't care what this really said. They took it and they twisted it. Made it into what they wanted it to say. They used it to get around other parts of it. Their traditions help them supersede the law. <laughs> Today is the same way. People don't want to read it. They don't want to obey it. They want to pick and choose from it. Today they call it progressive Christianity or deconstruction. We're going to choose what we're going to listen to and believe and others we're going to throw away and we're going to redo this old Christian thing because you guys got it wrong for the last 2,000 years. Same thing is going on here. Man's heart never changes, does it? The temple is where they worshipped and they had their false religious activity and the temple is where their heart was. So Jesus cleanses the temple. It wasn't a popular thing to do. He also started to teach them some things. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat as the leaders. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. For they... Bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So he condemns the religious leaders. But it went beyond just the hypocrisy of the leaders. It went to the Jews themselves. For they followed the lead of their leaders. And Jesus condemns this. Verse 5, but all their works they do to be seen by men. <laughs> the Pharisees wanted to be acknowledged how great they were, but other people were doing that. Common people were doing that. Go to the treasury and they drop in and let everyone know how much they dropped in. Or even in the beginning of the new church in the book of Acts, there were people going, look what we, how much money we've donated man's heart. For all their works they be doing seen by men. They want people to see how godly they are, how good they are. This still affects people today in churches. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. Okay. These people were more worried about outside appearance than the inward heart. We've had that problem for a long time in the church. People are more concerned how people dress in church. I don't care if you want to wear a three-piece suit. I don't even know if they make those anymore. But, and wear a tie every Sunday or a dress. Or if you want to come in shorts, a sandal, and a t-shirt. It does not matter. 
Just come to Jesus Christ. Have a heart for Christ. Doesn't matter what's on the outside. The only people in the entire Bible who are worried about their outward appearance are the Pharisees. Verse 6, they love the best places at the feast, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. You see, they love the best places at the feast, the best seats. They seek to profit from their faith, from the religion. They seek to make the faith more about themselves. Oh, instead of being servants, they seek to be served. And today, we have that in churches. Churches cater to them. They want, that's why they want churches to cater to them. They want pastors to cater and teach what they want to hear. Make it all about us. Entertain us. Oh, Pastor, you really want people to come to your church? You better entertain us. You better teach us what we want to hear. You better entertain us. You better tell jokes, funny stories, keep us interested. Oh, you better have lights and lasers and smoke for the worship. And the worship better move me. Well, no, actually, the only one who should be moved by our worship is the object of the worship. God Almighty should be moved, not you. If you are being moved by worship, if you don't feel good enough in worship, guess who's being worshipped? You. In vain, you worship God. What we see happening here in Jerusalem, where they miss Jesus Christ completely, is what's happening still today. There's only one who should be honored in the church, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, that's it. Because the rest of us, we're servants, we're slaves, and we're all on the same level here. I may be elevated a few feet above you right now, but that's not reality. We're all same team, servants, slaves. Jesus has shown up to this city, a city full of people who want one thing from him, kingship. King, come in here, get rid of the Romans, and make life good for us. Disciples even wanted this. The disciples asked him in the beginning of the book of Acts, are you going to restore the kingdom now? Oh, a sinful humanity. Even after we're saved, we can still think about self. They wanted freedom from Rome and then they wanted a pat on the back for being God's good little children who have a temple. But Jesus does none of these things. He points out their hypocrisy from the leadership on down. He runs them, everyone, out of the temple from the leadership on down. And he tells them, from the leadership on down, you're going to be destroyed. He points out their religious, self-centered hypocrisy. But it gets worse. Jesus now, this is probably the third strike. He's already struck out once, twice now with what they want. Here's strike probably three for him. He says, Matthew 23, verse 9, Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ, the anointed one. Only one father. You have a heavenly father. But they had long left him. 
Heavenly Father, that they recreated in their own prideful hearts. They were no longer obeying His Word. Only one true teacher, only one in all of Israel was teaching the truth. Only one! Jesus Christ. The one who humbly rode in on a donkey. The one who came to be served, or to serve, not to be served. The one who loved them more than they could fathom. The one who was willing to die for them, even though he knew they would reject him. He still came to them. Now Jesus tells them one more thing that will strike hardest at their prideful hearts. Matthew 23, verse 11. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. The crowds looked for a Messiah who would rescue them politically, free them nationally. But Jesus had come to save them spiritually. Humankind's primary need is spiritual. You have a dead spirit in you from sin and trespasses. And you are separated from God. Your greatest need is not political. It's not social justice. Not cultural. Not even national salvation. Many today call on Jesus across our country to save our country, but not the people. They want the nation saved. They want their American values, and they want America great again. The nation. They love the nation more than they love Jesus Christ. Just like the Jews love the temple more than they did God. And I'm a patriot, don't get me wrong. But the Bible has foretold us that all nations will come against God. All nations will come against Jesus Christ eventually, including the United States. And our loyalty is not here, it is up above. A lot of people today use Jesus to get what they want. Even as the multitudes waved the palm branches on that Sunday, shouted for joy, they missed the true reason why Jesus had come. They could neither see nor understand the cross. That's why as Jesus approached Jerusalem, he wept. And I believe he's probably wept a lot in the last 2,000 years. See, it was very simple, and Jesus told them from the very beginning what he was all about. But they did not want what he was bringing. John 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. When Moses was in, they were in the wilderness, and the people had become very sinful, and, and, and God sent serpents to strike the people. Because they were rejecting Moses, they were rejecting God. And these poisonous serpents were biting people and people were dying. And God says, listen, Moses, and put a bronze pole with a serpent on it. And if the people are bitten by a snake and if they, by faith, will look to this pole, they'll be healed miraculously. The pole with a snake on it, the snake represents sin. The people were having to acknowledge that they were sinful. They had to look to this pole to acknowledge their sinfulness against God so they could be healed. Jesus says, even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Jesus, up on the cross, who became our sin. We have to look to the cross. We have to look to the death of Christ and see that we are sinful and we caused that. He died in our place. And we must believe by faith. Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world at this point. He wasn't coming to condemn and judge at this point. That's another day fixed in the future. But here he was coming not to condemn, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus was coming to die for our sins, our self-righteousness. To die on our behalf to bring us peace with God. Romans 5 verse 1, Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, having been justified by faith, faith in Jesus Christ on the cross, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he was coming to do. And that's what he did. The people didn't see it. They didn't want it. And for many of them, that was the, their fate. Sealed them. Destroyed them. Could you fall into that category this morning? Do you have peace with God today in your life? You can't get it through religion, church attendance, church service, good works of any kind. You can only get it by being born again in faith in Jesus Christ. Have you been truly born again, saved by Jesus Christ? Today, there are many people like the Jews of Jesus' day who have missed the true meaning and purpose of the church, of the gospel, of the word of God, of Christianity. Oh, please don't let it be any one of you. When God visited you with the truth, did Jesus have a triumphal entry into your heart? in your life. I hope so. If he has made a triumphal entry into your life and he is the Lord of your life, not just Savior, but Lord, owner, master, then you are obligated to take that to the world. You're peace of the world, whatever that may be. If you have peace with God, you are called to help others find that peace. It's not just my job as a pastor, not just ministers, minister, missionaries out there, not just you know, evangelists and all people. No, it's all of us. I love what Spurgeon said. Every born-again believer is a missionary. When you leave these doors, you enter the mission field. Whew. Palm Sunday. The Jewish people completely missed the reason for the triumphal entry. They did not realize God was with them. God in human flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. That's who Jesus Christ is. Who he was then and who he is today. Today, the church in America has become very much like the Jewish people of Jesus' day. Many churches are trying to focus on social justice, political issues, and saving America. It's not what we're about. It's not what we're about. Read the book. We're about lost souls. Many are seeking for the church to bless them, to entertain them. No, we're here to equip you. We're here to teach you discipleship. Jesus did not come to save nations and governments. He did not come to bring social justice. And he did not come to entertain us. 
Jesus came to die for us. And that's what the triumphal entry is all about. And through his death, we can find mercy and grace. And in the grace, we can find salvation. Let us who have been saved be about the same mission as the one who saved us. Let us bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are lost. Let us not forget or ever stop cherishing that Jesus rode into Jerusalem to his death because we have been saved because he rode in. And we have been saved because he is God in human flesh. Emmanuel. God with us. Let's pray. And dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, we praise you this morning. I know the courage. You know, I, I can't say I know it, but I, I can kind of fathom, we can, Lord, that the courage it took for you to ride into Jerusalem, to travel Jerusalem, knowing what lay ahead of you. The scourging alone would scare most people from going in, let alone the crucifixion. And Lord, just because you were God in human flesh, you were fully man fully God, but fully man, your body was going to feel the pain. And your heart was going to feel the pain from your own people rejecting you, your own disciples forsaking you. you saw, there was nothing in Jerusalem for you but pain and suffering. And you went anyway. Because for the joy that was set before you, you were going to endure the cross for us. For the will of the Father, because everything you did was pleasing to the Father. You rode into Jerusalem. And Lord, we can never thank you enough for that. We praise you this morning. And we are so thankful that you were with us, that we want to remember that as we leave. So Lord, you are Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you and we praise you and we lift your name on, on high. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's sing this song. Who are we that you would be mindful of us? What do you see that's worth looking our way? We are free in ways that we never should be.
so much to be thankful for. God has given us so much. Don't worry about what you don't have in this life. You have enough if you have Christ. Let's take him out there to the world. Let's go show him and tell people about him. Let's go be his team. Let's play hard. Let's not give up. We don't even know if yet we're in the fourth quarter yet. We don't know how much time we have left. We've got to keep playing, keep playing hard. If you don't know Jesus Christ, come talk to me. If you're not sure, come talk to me. Let's break out of here. We've got one week till Easter. Let's see if we can engage somebody with the truth of gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ, or at least get them into church here. Drag them into church. Just don't get caught by Trevor or anybody with a badge. Okay? Let's go get some people. Let's go, let's go be fishers of men and women and teens. Let's go fishing this week. Amen? Amen. Let's break out our count of three. One, two, three. Break. Let's go.